Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Um, I'm here with uh, famous hippopotamus uh, who is behind, uh, well, behind the, <laughs> the subreddits, uh, D&D Behind the Screen and DM Academy, a bunch of other ones. Um, yeah. And uh, he's going to be talking about uh, the, f I guess, a bunch of different topics. I mean, you kind of gave us a preview of that list uh, the other day and it was a bunch of different yeah. philosophy related topics about D&D. So, um, yeah, I won't, without further ado, I guess, why don't you take it away? Okay. Uh, just wanted to thank Sam and all you guys for showing up. Um, I'm not the least bit nervous or terrified, so bear with me. Uh, I'm going to flip on my video for a couple seconds to show you that I'm not a golem. Uh, so, hello, everybody. I'm a real person. <laughs> um, so, I didn't want this to be so much of a lecture. Um, I mean, I'd like to take questions along the way as we go. Oh, I should have mentioned that too. Actually, uh, if you want to, yeah, if you want to ask a question, you can uh, type it in the special events text channel that's uh, directly above this channel, this voice channel. Or if you want to have your microphone unmuted uh, to ask a, you know, yeah, ask a question or make a comment or something, just say that you want to do that, and then I can manually unmute you. Um, just keep in mind that after you're done asking your question or making a comment, please remute yourself. Otherwise, I have to server mute you, which is not less ideal. All right. So um, my philosophy of D and D, uh, I've been playing a long time since the '70s. Uh, I started DMing in 1990. Uh, obviously, I've taken breaks along the way, but um, I'm sort of, you know, I'm a mix of old school sort of thinking and the new way of doing things. Um, I'm not Matt Mercer. I'm not Matt Colville. I'm not really like anybody else. I'm sort of sort of like myself, I guess. Um, you know, Reddit was real, a really good, um, amazing place to find for me because back in the day there was no really community. Um, you just kind of had to drop a hint at a party or somewhere and hope somebody knew what the hell you were talking about. So having all these resources in one place and everybody talking to each other is amazing. You guys should feel lucky that you have that. Um, so. The way I sort of see D and D is, um, I come from the era when the game was a lot more difficult, um, and people say that there wasn't a lot of role playing back then, which isn't true. We role played the hell out of ourselves. Um, we died a lot, but it wasn't just hack and slash, um, kill the monster, take the gold kind of games. I mean, there were those, but that's that's not all that there was. And sort of stemming from that was the this idea of, is that the world doesn't care about you, at least not at first. Um, every game that I sort of was in or every game I ran, nobody ever started as a hero. Um, we came up with this idea of, of level zero, uh, which was sort of just a narrative chat where you would talk about who you were before you became an adventurer. Like, where did you grow up? What, was your, what were your teachers like? Um, a lot of stuff that's in sort of that session zero questionnaire that are all floating around the web. Um, we kind of did that uh, as well. And then we would launch what we called what i call the catalyst so the catalyst is the event that propels you into the adventure propels you out of level zero and into level one and it sort of defines your purpose and defines um what the scope of the game is going to be um and for years and years and years and years and years i wrote plot and i had preset villains and i and i did all that stuff that you're supposed to do and i ran a few modules here and there but i really wanted to play homebrew um my friend had a huge map of greyhawk and Every time I looked at it, I'm like, man, I want a world like that. Um, I want to build something that's personal to me. Um, so I sort of my, I guess the idea that the world doesn't care about you sort of stems from the fact that um, I wanted to push my players into places in the world where they had not been, they hadn't heard about into the wilderness, so to speak, because mostly because I wanted to flesh out this world that I was building. And the only way to do that is if people went there, because I have this idea that, well, Gygax back in the day had this, this um, idea about world building. He called it building a milieu. Um, and the idea was is that you built the stage and you populated it um, before the characters got there. So the world wasn't built around the characters. The characters had to jump into the world that was already built. So you would build a region. Like I, I like to liken it to flying in an airplane. You're flying in an airplane and you look outside, out the window, and what you can see is a region. And that's sort of what you start with. Um, and you put in all your terrain and then you figure out um, where the cities are going to be based on the natural resources, um, connect everything up with roads, and then figure out where what pockets of monsters and, and other things were living where. Um, and this idea of building uh, organic ecologies um, 
So, you know, I might um, get a list of 40 planes creatures or force creatures and, and roll eight times. And the, the list of eight that I get, I would sit down and I'd look at them and I'd think about, okay, well, how are all these creatures coexisting with each other? Um, what's the state of play? Are they at war? Are they allies? Are they scavengers? Are they ones that are, are being parasites to other ones? Um, instead of like sort of trying to do it naturally, I would do it randomly and then try to come up with a story that that would make sense. I found that really, really exciting and world building. Um, and that sort of blossomed in a lot of the, the way I started to think about D and D was I wanted, I wanted verisimilitude. I wanted, I wanted the world to feel organic and natural and not, not a stage, especially built for the players or the characters of that story. Um, and feeding into that was sort of this idea of um, session zero and talking about theme and boundaries. Um, so whenever I do a session zero, I sit down and I talk about, I'm like, well, you know, what do you guys want to explore? What's the kind of narrative or story or setting or something that you've never done before that you'd like to do? What's interesting to you? We sit down, we have a conversation, we kind of hammer that out. Um, what's the theme going to be? Um, the last uh, campaign I ran before I left Australia because I lived down there for decades. Uh, was a street gang campaign and set in this city that I have that's about four times as big as L four times larger than Los Angeles, a uh, massive city of corruption. Um, and they, uh, they wanted to explore a street gang uh, and the idea that people who were born on born in, in poverty and, and, and oppression um, trying to rise against that and what would that look like and what would that feel like? And I was like, cool, all right. So in addition to theme, you need to talk about boundaries. Okay, so like what kinds of characters would make sense in this setting? Um, I know there's this idea where people show up to a, to a session zero or show up to a campaign, they've got a character in mind, they've got their sheet already made and they show up and they're like, great. And then the, the group has to sort of figure out why you're all together. And I sort of feel like that's needlessly complicated. I like to do that in session zero. We talk about theme and then we start talking about the boundaries. Um, so. I might say, okay, the, one of the first things I ask the people before we even discuss character or, or race or, or any of that stuff is, is how do you guys know each other? Are you going to be friends? Do you work together? Are you family? I love doing families. Um, establish that relationship first. And once that relationship is established, then we can start talking about what kind of characters you guys can build. Um, so by building the group together, um, Everyone's talking to each other. I'm like, well, you know, I'm thinking about building this like wizard and maybe he's into enchantment and maybe an illusion and make me somebody else will jump in and say, yeah, I really like that idea. Like maybe I was a rogue and I'm a rogue and I've been, you know, you've been helping me while I'm trying to steal money for the family and stuff like that. And it creates this conversation around what the group should look like instead of people showing up with their potluck dinners, you know, and there's a, so I kind of, I guess I kind of, um, prefer to sort of build the session themes around conversations with my players instead of me coming up with an idea. I prefer to do it more collaboratively, I guess. Um, I'm going to stop there because I need a drink. And if anybody wants to ask, ask any questions, feel free. God, please, somebody ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like I said, if you have something, just uh, type it into special events text and we'll call you out. Otherwise, I'm going to ram ramble like a crazy person for an hour. <laughs> well, I'll keep an eye on it. If someone asks, I'll, I'll let you know. Oh, there we go. Someone might have posted something there. Uh, BCD, uh, how long does character creation take? Um, it depends. Um, back in the day when we were all teenagers and we didn't have to work or go to school, especially in the summertime, uh, we'd run these level zero stories individually, uh, and they'd usually take a couple hours. Um, nowadays, whenever, when we do it all together, it probably takes, I don't know, two hours. Cause I like to have the, I like to have the guys build the sheets right there at the table together. Um, I like to play in meat space. I've not really played online at all. I'm going to do a one shot with a couple people from this server. Um, probably next week or the week after, just to get used to online gaming. So, how does it work with a group of strangers? Um, well, it sometimes works. It sometimes is difficult to get that idea across to people who definitely want to show up with an idea. 
um, crafting a good group is really hard. Um, sometimes you have to get lucky. Sometimes you have to kick people out that just don't fit and hope you can get lucky with the next person. Then you find a group that has some synergy and, and with each other. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, the difficult part is when people just don't want to play along and want to definitely like, well, I want to play this drow barbarian and I'm not changing. So that can be a challenge. Just waiting on Trickster. Uh, while well, these guys are typing, I think I'm going to talk about uh, note taking next, um, and then do some talk about some future proofing, uh, which is this thing that I do, uh, where I drop stuff into the narrative that I don't know what it does, I don't know what its purpose is, but it's sort of there to save my ass when I'm improvising. Um, but I'll get to that. Um, but I might move on to the to the note taking um, while these guys are typing. So um, taking notes. Uh, so after every scene, I ask my group to give me a couple minutes and I write down in bullet points everything that's happened. Um, I track um, who's done what, who's talked to who. Um, if I can, I like to track what objects have either come into the party's possession or what objects have left. Um, sometimes I'll write down um, maybe the brief conversation details of who they've talked to. Um, and I do that after every scene and I don't, I don't, I try really hard not to forget to do that because when I go back to prep for the next week, I can look through and I can see everything that I've done. And I like to write recaps up, uh, for myself and for posterity and talk about how I prepped and the mistakes I made and the things I did right and whatever. Um, so really, really, really good note-taking I think is important. Um, I've seen way too many DMs who don't really note-take at all. Or they don't write down enough. Um, yeah, you need to be as detailed as you can because you know lots of things can happen between now and and next week or two weeks or the next month or whenever you play. So it's much better to have more detail than less, I guess. Um, Trickster with a question: What are some strategies to help a player who doesn't have a backstory fleshed out and isn't big on role playing? Trying to bring her more actively into the campaign, but it's tough without a solid backstory. Um, I would probably sit down with them individually and just start asking them just session zero questions. Um, you know, what, what was your family like? Uh, do you have any brothers? Do you have any sisters? Do you have any pets? Uh, tell me about friends you had as a kid. Tell me about enemies you had as a kid. Tell me about your hobbies. Um, and you know, if they're having trouble coming up with some things on their own, then you can, you know, give them a few examples like, um, you know, what were your hobbies? Did you like to fish? Did you like to paint? Did you like to go horseback riding or whatever? Some people need sort of lists uh, of choices. Um, I don't know. I've kind of done that with a lot of people who were, were were not really into the whole backstory thing. And that's worked pretty well for me. Uh, there's nobody else around, so there's no pressure. Um, it's just the two of you having a conversation. I mean, doing it online through text is probably would be great because there's even less pressure to be in the person's presence because I know some people have a lot of anxiety around that. Um, yeah, I think you just got to sit down and be individual with them, really. Uh, sorry, I'm typing a question. Um, so I think I'll talk about future proofing. So, I mean, I wrote a post about this, but future proofing for me is when uh, I'm kind of improvising off of what I think is going to happen. Um, and I need tools to allow me to tell the narrative or to give myself an escape when I don't know what to do. Um, so for an example, uh, let's say the party goes into a cave and um, they've, they're going in there because I, uh, five minutes ago, said that they heard a noise coming from that direction. Um, they get into the cave and they ask me what they see. And I say, okay, there's a it's a pretty deep cave. Your torchlight doesn't show you the back of it. There's way too much gloom and shadow, but uh, you can definitely hear the sound of water dripping. Um, and uh, there's litter and detritus on the ground out here. No bones. Doesn't look like there's any blood stains or anything. And whatever sound you heard, you haven't heard before. So at this point, the, probably, the party is probably going to push forward into the cave. 
and I'm thinking, okay, well, I don't really know what's in this cave because I'm improvising. And I mean, I could pluck a monster out of my head and that'd be fine. But um, sometimes it's more interesting to give yourself ideas that aren't just that. So I might say another a couple feet later, you see a, a really thick white chalk line um, stretching horizontally across the front of you like a like somebody's taken a chalk line and drawn it all the way across the line of the cave. Um, and every every foot or so, there's a sigil. Uh, I have no idea what this line is. I have no idea what the sigils are. Um, but I've given myself something for the party to interact with. Um, and they might say, okay, well, I'm going to cast Detect Magic on the chalk line. Um, and at the, in this moment, I think, okay, well, is this thing magical or not? And sometimes it might just roll a die quietly or flip a coin in my head. Um, and sort of that's how I try to improvise is by putting stuff there that I don't know what it does and then sort of deciding what that's going to do in the moment um, because I don't really write plot. Uh, I don't have preset villains. Um, my idea of villainry in D&D is that villains should arise organically. Uh, I'm like, because I've t t told so many end of the world stories, save the world stories that I'm kind of tired of that. So about 10 or 15 years ago, I quit doing those kinds of stories. And say the party might stumble across a bunch of smugglers and they kill a few of them and take their goods. Um, the person who they're working for could potentially become a villain in the story if the villain can find out who killed his men. Um, but it's not a guarantee. So that person may not become a villain. I like the villains to arise from the party's actions. Um, because action should ripple through your world. Um, the party might like the world may not care about them at first, but eventually, as they get stronger, their actions are going to start to make a difference to the world. It might just only be locally; it might be in the, just the village they're in, or the region they're in, or whatever. But, um, yeah, I'm going to shut up now. Uh, can I give a concrete example of a rippling effect? Sure. Um, okay, so let's say, let's say the party comes across a, a, a wagon train of smugglers. Um, and they've got uh, casks of mushroom wine in the back of their wagons. Um, the wa and, the, and the wine is poisoned. And the idea is that the villain is using these guys to poison a village so that he can raise them all into undeath for some larger purpose. Um, at the same time, uh, in the region uh, is a small paladin group. There's like four of them. Um, they know something hinky is going on in the area, but they haven't been able to track down the source. So they're in the region, but they haven't come across the villains or the party yet, um, or this gang, I should say. So the party finds the vill finds this gang. They kill a few of them, and they might take a couple of barrels of wine because why not? Why not have a party, not knowing the stuff's poisoned, um, interrupting that process um, is going to change lots of things. Um, the paladins may hear about this that this wagon train got attacked. Um, maybe the party left. Um, more than a few bodies. Maybe they left a lot of bodies behind, but maybe some of the bad guys got away. Um, maybe they delivered what they could to the village and some people have died. So just that one act of interfering with this wagon train um, can ripple outward. The, the villain may hear about it and send you know people to this village to find out what's happened. Start asking questions. They might get the description of the party and he might send people out to try and find them and the party might find themselves getting attacked by people not knowing why. Um, so yeah, ripples, they, they can go lots of, lots of places. Uh, who wants to role play, but has extreme difficulty doing it. One of my players tries to role play, but ends up not knowing what to say and just doesn't say anything. Um, well, I mean, this is going to sound taboo, but some people just probably shouldn't play D and D if it's that, if they have that much anxiety, I don't know, play something else. Um, they can always talk in third person and role playing isn't, isn't. It, no, the role playing isn't acting. There's no, 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 nothing that says that you have to act. You just have to make choices as the character. Um, they don't even, you know, they don't even have to have dialogue with people. They could just say, "I talked to John about what we're going to do next," and that's good enough for some people. Um, I don't know. It really depends on the individual person. Maybe trying to find out what their anxiety is all about and what you can do to mitigate it, or you know, what the group can do to mitigate it. I guess it really depends. Being a dungeon master is like you have a lot of you wear a lot of hats, I guess, social worker included, I guess. Uh, 
A couple of questions coming. Uh, I'm gonna while I'm waiting, I'm gonna talk about um, how I prep for the game. Uh, I know there's a guy named Sly Flourish out here who wrote a book called The Lazy DM. I've never read it. I don't know anything about the guy. Um, but when I saw that, I'm like, ah, that's kind of me. Um, because I stopped writing plot, because I stopped creating villains, because I build the region first, my idea is that you spend a lot of time building the stage. You know, for me, it'd be 10 to 20 hours probably. Uh, and when I get to get into the session, at least the sessions after the catalyst, I don't really do much except I think about where the party might go, potentially, what they might do, potentially. And then I write 10 random encounters that have some meat on them. Um, so a, an encounter for me isn't just orcs. Your encounter table should never have just that. It might be orcs are attacking a farmer and the farmer has killed a few of them. Um, and you know, it has to be, it has to be a scene. It has to be, a, you know, in medias res is probably the best, the best way to write encounters. The party stumbles across this thing that is going on. Um, so I write 10 of those or 20 of those or whatever. And, uh, I spend a lot of time pre-visualizing. Um, if I know the party's in the mountains and I know there's a cave, they might be interested in looking. I close my eyes and I walk around that cave and I ask myself, what do I smell? What do I hear? What's the temperature like? I try to do that as much as I can so that when I'm in the moment, I don't have to fumble for a description because I don't really like to write stuff down because then it sounds like you're reading because you kind of are. Um, and going along with that is I kind of try to do that with NPCs as well, although I'm kind of shit at NPCs. Um, but I try to like, uh, if I get a chance, I'll like ask the NPC questions. I like to do this when I'm driving and then answer as the NPC and you know, try to anticipate what I think the party might ask me, try to get the characters tone down, their mannerisms, any kind of slang or speech, whatever things that they do. Uh, I don't always get a chance to do that, but I, I, at the times I've done it, it's really helped a lot. Um, because for me personally, um, I'm not good at creating NPC, interesting NPCs on the fly. That's always been one of my weaknesses. And every DM has got some, and that's kind of mine. Um, all right, I go back to the questions. How do you balance rail versus open world exploration? And as a follow up, how do you push characters along? Um, right. So the only rail that really exists in my campaigns is the catalyst. That that's going to happen. Um, I try to have the catalyst happen to all of them. You know, even if they're scattered, I try to have the same event push them into the story. Um, after that, I, there are no rails. Um, the party drives the story. I don't write plot. I, I don't act. I react. I'm, you know, I'm furiously building the world around the party as they walk around. I, I am the fog. I'm the living fog of war. Um, and how do I push them along? I don't. Um, it's not the DM show. It's the, it's the group show. It's the us show. Uh, I expect my parties to be curious and interested and want to explore the world and want to explore the narrative. And if they just stand there and do nothing, then I find myself another group. I mean, to be honest, um, I'm not there to entertain you. Um, we are doing this together. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't push characters at all. Um, what is the format you use for taking notes post session slash encounter? Um, I just write down on a piece of paper. I just write bullet notes. Um, I pretty much do everything, um, analog cause, um, that's just not used to playing with computers and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I know that's not a great answer, but that's pretty much all I do is I just write it down on paper. Uh, motivation drives action. If you ask the player what their character's motivations are, they might be able to understand them a bit more. I usually send my players lists of personality questions. This is from Apollo. Yeah, I mean, you can do that. Um, I try to do that in the beginning because characters are going to change as they go. It's funny because uh, uh, years and years ago, a really good friend of mine um, ran me through a couple of sessions of The Burning Wheel. Uh, which is an RPG I'd never heard of. I didn't know anything about. And it was the craziest thing because at one point he asked me what my character was thinking. And I kind of laughed and I'm like, what do you what do you mean? I'm like, I'm playing D and D. I, I you know, I'm a D and D player. I don't know what my character's thinking. I I don't know. And he really sort of tried to challenge me about what I was thinking and what I was believing and what I was feeling. And you know, this game includes um, you know, you write down some beliefs, these things that you believe about the world. And you write down some instincts, which are things that you always do. And it's sort of the storyteller's job to challenge those things. 
So if you believe that, um, you know, the church of X uh, is a, is doing good, then the storyteller will oftentimes show you how that's not true. And I kind of like that idea about doing that in D&D and um, getting them to think, like Alpala was saying, get them to think about themselves as more than just a, a collection of, of numbers, really. Um, what else should I talk about now? Any other questions? Otherwise, I guess I'll pick something off the list. Um, <laughs> uh, why weather matters? That's 19 on my list. Um, why weather matters? Weather, weather matters beyond just being an obstacle. Um, for me, weather is, uh, is a re really great big world building paintbrush. Um, that I can use, um, you know, just saying it's raining is not really all that interesting. Um, but if it's been raining for a week and the roads are muddy and all the game is bedded down and you're running out of food and, you know, you've lost the trail, then weather makes a difference. And then horribly, there's a cold snap and it starts to snow and everything's turned to concrete. Um, that is way more interesting narratively than just it's raining and you're you're moving through difficult terrain <clears throat> excuse me um you know contrary wise if there's you know sun there's been you know it's been sunny and dry for a month there might be wildfires there might be you know communities that have their water their water's dried up and their crops are dying or whatever you know, weather should play a role in the story and not just be something that you really know that, that comes up on a random thing because you've pushed a button and it says oh it's sunny today it's sunny it should be sunny for a reason sometimes not all the time but a lot of times it should it should matter uh paul is asking me what are my thoughts on random encounter tables and the hex call hex crawl travel method um i love random encounter tables i write my own um the things that i don't use um sometimes will go on to the next list um Back when I was running 2E, I, I spent a lot of time writing encounter lists for the regions that I was playing in and tossing out stuff that I didn't like. Because I noticed that I'd roll on a table and I'd sometimes get the same result. And every time I'd roll that, I'd be like, nah, pick something else. If you do that to something twice, just take it off the list and don't use it. Because you obviously don't want to. You want to have everything on your list be something that you want to run and something that's useful and interesting. Uh, hex crawl. I've never played a hex crawl. I've heard lots and lots of people talking about it and I've read a lot about it um it's fine i guess it makes the game a bit more like a board game i guess um it's not something i have much much experience with though uh trickster is asking what are some world building strategies you can incorporate into a pre-built campaign and any thoughts on modding pre-built campaigns i don't know that's a tough one for me because i don't i've never really done that i've always played homebrew uh when i decided to dm in 1990 i'm like right i'm drawing my own world and I drew five blobs on paper and I named them all and I put some dots on them and made, named them some cities and I drew in some rivers and that was it. That's how I started. Um, I played as a player in Greyhawk a lot. Uh, I played a bit of Dark Sun. I played some Planescape. Uh, I played loads of other RPGs. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I can really answer that. I, I guess being not so precious about the canon of the world that you're in and feeling free to change whatever you'd like to make it more interesting that's probably what i would do um and you know a lot of pre-built campaigns don't have that much detail in them like i'm nuts about cities i love making my cities really 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 detailed like i like naming the alleyways i like having statues and and you know npcs that you see all the time at the same corner and stuff like that so i would and for me personally if i was going to mod a pre-built campaign i would probably flesh out all the areas of civilization uh blue death is asking how do you deal with the six to eight encounter balance of 5e uh, i think it's silly and i don't do it i don't know anybody who does um how do you handle the bog down of combat encounters for what is an easy encounter that ends in less than one round is that fun to players or do you focus on medium and above um one of my former moderators on the subreddit on dnd behind the screen uh named orcish blade wrote this post called keeping combat short and to the point um, and I pretty much refer everyone to it because it's brilliant. And the idea is that fights should have meaning um, beyond just draining your resources. Um, they should be interesting for the for the party as well. And if you're gonna, if the party's gonna rock up on some group of goblins and they're eighth level. They, I just say you slaughter the goblins. You know, if they say they want to attack them. I just tell them they're dead because 
why waste time? Combat is can be a slog, especially the bigger the group you have. Uh, that's why I like playing with small groups, like three people or less, sometimes really fun. Um, yeah, I mean, I just don't think you should have to play out every battle to the to the bitter end. If the party is fighting a bunch of kobolds and the kobolds have lost more than half their numbers, then I, I roll a morale check. Uh, and if the morale check fails, I let the, I have the kobolds flee. Um, very little, very few things are going to fight to the death. Animals especially won't, unless they're cornered. Um, and most creatures that have any kind of sense in their head, if they're losing, they're going to run. Um, so the combat doesn't have to end with one side dead. It can end with, you know, the encounter ending, I guess. Um, and that sort of feeds into, like, you know, how I use tactics and strategies. Um, I know there's websites out there and there's people talking about, you know, really detailed um, strategies for, for running monsters. Um, what the monsters know, I think that's called one of them that's called that, which is great. But like in the moment, you may not have to you may not have time to remember all that intricate detail. Um, especially especially if you put the plot down two hours ago and you're just running off of pure adrenaline because you don't have any idea where the party's gonna go. They took your plot and toss it off a cliff. Um, so basic tactics. So every encounter, every combat encounter for me should have there should be a point. like the monsters have a goal. What do the monsters want in this in this encounter? Do they want to? Are they just trying to get past the party? Are they trying to protect something? Um, are they want to kill the party for their supplies or their food or to eat them? Really? Um, so you know, I might write down um, at, at the top of like my little you know combat tracker, which is just a sheet of paper where I keep track of the initiative and the hit points. I might just write defend. Um, and sometimes I'll write a parameter underneath that tactic that reminds me that I should that 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 static thing should change. So I might write uh, defend, and then I write fifty percent um, roll roll morale check. So if they've lost their numbers, I'll roll morale check under that defend condition. And if they do change, if they if they do fail the morale check, then I cross defend out and I write flee. And I try to have them flee you know, in a way, in, in a withdrawal way, so they're not getting slaughtered, so they're kind of fighting their way out. The, sometimes. Uh, it sort of depends on the intelligence of the creature. Um, you know, the tactics might be annihilate, um, but the monsters might see they're winning, and they might notice that the, that the wizard is using this really cool wand. Uh, maybe the creatures aren't smart enough that they, they think that might be pretty valuable. Um, so that that tactic of annihilate might become snatch the wand. Um, if they can grab that wand and get the hell out of dodge without losing any more people, that's much more preferable than than fighting a combat that's going to go on for far too long. Um, geez, I, that was a long talk. I need some water. Sorry. Right, so Blue Death asks, how do you deal with fleeing creatures? Disengage and movement makes it trivial to dash and attacks of opportunity until they die. Um, honestly, if if the party wants to pursue, uh, if the party doesn't want to pursue, then nothing happens. They just flee. Now, if the party wants to pursue and destroy the the fleeing creatures, um, it kind of depends for me. Um, if the creatures are really really hurt, I just kind of let the party slaughter them. Um, if healthy people are fleeing. Um, then I sort of do turn it into a chase. Um, and there's lots of chase mechanics out there. Feel free to look up your favorite. Um, but yeah, I don't really like stuff to go on for too long, if I can help it. Um, if the party is four people and they're chasing 20 kobolds, and the kobolds all peel off in different directions, they're really only going to be able to chase four. And if they kill those four... That's not really a big deal to me. The kobolds got away. They might regroup. They might make a decision to attack the party later or get out, get the hell out of the region or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, you can't really kind of get away from that mechanical boringness of, of running away. But narratively, there's a few things you can try uh, to do if if it's just not going to be fun, I guess. Um, okay, so another question. Uh, well, this is not a question. This is just 
a statement. That's all right. Um, what should I talk about next? Ah, secret roles. Okay, so um, I like having a dice tower where the party members can roll dice and the result faces me. Uh, I do that with knowledge checks primarily. Um, the reason I like to do it is because I think that falsehoods and rumors and not knowing everything is kind of a good idea. Um, so if you roll low, I usually feed you misinformation or disinformation. Um, you might remember things that, you know, that, that represents you misremembering things. Because um, even the best of us think we might be right and we're completely wrong. Um, I don't know how many thousands of times I've done that. So I like the idea of introducing falsehoods into the game. I like spreading rumors, good or bad or true. I mean, they're, they're going to continually change as they spread out. Sometimes they can affect the story. Sometimes they can affect the players. Um, I don't have a problem with my NPCs lying to my party because people lie every day for the stupidest goddamn reasons. Um, and it's kind of a normal thing, especially social lies. Um, so I try to tell my party when we start that, you know, this is not black and white. It's not a video game. People are going to lie to you. Be prepared for that. Um, and don't don't trust everyone just because they say something. Um, and there has been some pushback against that. People like to roll dice. Um, but the reason I like to have the rolls in secret is because it prevents, prevents that metagaming of, oh, I rolled a one. I guess I don't know anything. Because that's kind of boring. Um, so you don't know how you've rolled. And I t try to deliver the information with a poker face. And you don't know whether I'm telling the truth or not. And your character believes that and acts upon it. And I don't know. It's been really cool. It's, it's like really made the, the games and the campaigns quite interesting sometimes because of that. Uh, okay. Um, I think I might take two minutes because i got to run to the bathroom. Thanks, guys. Uh, questions in the chat would be great. All right. Sounds good. Cool, thanks for all the uh, questions and comments, everyone. That was a lot, It's pretty cool. I'm kind of curious actually to the chat. Um, he, uh, he mentioned a little bit earlier that he's sort of tired of like save the day type of story, save the world type of stories and stuff. And I also feel that same sort of thing. Is Does anyone else also feel like every video game, every movie, it's always just like a boat you being the hero and having to save like the entire world and like i'm i don't know does that is anyone else bored by that kind of thing i because i keep thinking to myself I'm, i kind of want to just play like we're, we're playing divinity 2 right now or whatever and um and i was like man i wish i could just be like some person in the world without having to save the world you know just kind of <laughs> Um, thoughts on fudging dice results. Um, when I started, I fudged all the freaking time was because I was learning. Um, I don't have any problem with that when you're learning. Um, you've got to learn. I mean, CR is pointless. And I think everybody's come to the realization that it's not a great metric. Um, you know, um, if the parties reckon your monsters and the combat looks like it's going to be boring, give more hit points. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, there are people who are really against that who roll in the open and that's fine but i don't think it really teaches you anything because D, D is not just an action game it's kind of a narrative as well and you want those highs and lows and those interesting moments and i think fudging for now and again for narrative sake isn't really necessarily a sin yeah and if you fudge you don't tell the players obviously um but while i was learning i did it a lot because i needed to um i was learning how to build encounters and i was learning what creature combinations would work against my party, what didn't work, what was too strong, what wasn't, you know, what wasn't interesting. Um, yeah, I don't think it's really a sin. Um, right, uh, what else should I choose from the list? Um, right, so I guess I'll talk about plot threads a little bit. So I've, I've sorry, I've been sick lately. My voice sounds like a broken record. Um, <clears throat> scratchy record, I mean. Um, so active holding and dead plot threads. Um, for me, those are the three kinds of things that I need to keep track of. Um, I like to have the world, like everything in the world can be a plot hook, kind of. Um, whatever the party wants to poke their nose into, whatever they're interested in doing becomes a hook. 
Um, I tell this really, um, I've told this story a bunch of times. I even wrote a post about it. Uh, I had these guys and we were playing this campaign. It was towards the end. Uh, they were in the tower. They were confronting the villain and the villain was giving his monologue. And the one guy turns to his friend and he's like, you know what? Fuck this. Let's go do that fishing charter thing we were going to do. And I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, we're going to split. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, we're, we're, we're leaving. I'm like, okay. Like, what about the end of the world? And like, you know, they're like, well, we don't care. We want to go do this. Like, we want to open a fishing charter. And, you know, and they got really excited about it. They were like talking about how there could be like pirates and shark attacks and this like whole thing. And I, I was just completely thrown off my stage. And I was, I, had, I didn't know what to say. Um, and I realized that um, I needed to end the session right there and then. And I did. And I, end of the session and I sat there in shock for a little while and then I was like, right, well, these guys want to go start a fishing charter business. I guess I better figure that out. So I wrote down a bunch of stuff, you know, like, you know, creepy villages and ghosts and pirates and all kinds of stuff, all these things that could affect the fishing business. Um and funny enough, these guys these guys never ended up getting that far. They got diverted by something else and ran off into the mountains and and I think they ended up getting killed by orcs shortly after. And I realized that I needed to stop being so precious about my plot because it was really about what the players wanted. So active threads are things that the party is interested in. And I know what the party is interested in because I flat out ask them, what do you like, especially at the end of the session, like, what do you guys think you're going to do next time? Um, and they tell me and I write it down. And those are the things I need to think about for next time. Um, um, those are active plot threads are the things I need to keep track of, the things I need to pay attention to, the things I need to pre-visualize. Um, holding plot heads, plot threads are stuff that the party wants to do, but they haven't gotten to it yet. And sometimes those plot threads will, I know that you know, I'm sure most, a lot of you have heard about, um, world timers and global timers or regional timers, whatever you want to call them, which is the idea that things, uh, events outside the party's control are advancing with or without them so you know it might be the end of the world story and there's a big clock that's ticking down and whatever the party's doing that clock keeps ticking um so the idea of holding plot threads is stuff that they want to do and there might be timers ticking down that will change how that's going to work when they come back to those uh, and then dead plot threads are stuff the party is not interested in anymore um, in, and I can let those fade away. Um, if they're world hooks, quote unquote, uh, they're kind of big things that have been started up by the party poking their nose into something, um, then I can't completely kill them. I turn them into holding, uh, holding threads, or I just shove them over into a global timer and, and have them, and I worry about that in a different way. Um, but when I'm taking my notes after each scene, like I'm writing down what, if there's any new hooks that have come up, I have to write those down so I remember. Um, so juggling those different kinds of plot hooks, you kind of need to pay attention to what your party's interested in and and not try to force stuff down their throat. At least my philosophy is you shouldn't do that. Um, yeah, when you're running sandbox campaigns, you, you kind of have to ask your party what they're going to do next because there's no way you can plan for everything. I built and ran a world for 27 years and I never finished building it. And there's places that I never actually got to go. Uh, and because of the way I world build, which um, I wrote a post about that, it's been referenced a lot, it's called The Map Tells Me, is when I draw a map, I write stuff on the map that I don't know what it is. That's kind of like the future-proofing thing. Um, I don't know what it is, and I, but I know someday I'll need something. Uh, I might need a tower. I might need an abandoned factory or something. And I'll, I'll, in the moment, I can look to the map and reach for that thing and say, oh, yes, this is the place you need to go and act like all smooth, like I always knew what it was, but I had no idea. I just needed something in the moment. So I have this place in Gemseed uh, called Scorpion Tower, and no one's ever been there. And it's been sitting there since 1991. Um, I have no idea what's there. Um, so I kind of like the, uh, this feeds into a larger theme that I kind of wanted to open with is this larger idea that the reason I DM is because I don't know what's going to happen. And that's the surprising, the, the surprising part is what makes it fun for me. Um, but yeah, so, uh, Blue Death asks, how do you deal with DM burnout on the main reoccurring theme of the campaign? 
uh, around level eight, I find it hard to continue the plot we have been building towards. Okay, well, um, I think this is something that too many DMs don't really like to embrace or admit to themselves. But the truth is, is that a campaign is not a sitcom. It's supposed to end. And not every campaign should go to 20 levels. I mean, that street gang campaign I ran, we ended, we ended at level four, I think, or five. Um, I think you sort of need to recognize when the story's over, it's over, and not and not push beyond that just because. I mean, if you're fans of Supernatural, you know what I'm talking about. Um, you know, the rest of it might be fun, but you kind of done you kind of came and did what you wanted to do and, and the story should sort of end now if you're if you're realizing that you're you've got a lot more story to tell and you're just burned out um there's nothing wrong with taking a break um and there's nothing wrong with looking at your main plot and shaking it up throw some throw some catapult stones in there like change your presumptions about what's been going on like you're like, all right, well, this guy's been planning this plot and he's got these pieces in play. Look at that and maybe say to yourself, yeah, but maybe that's not really what's going on. Maybe something else in the part of this puzzle has changed. And what could change? What can I change that'd be interesting? Like, all right, well, instead of this guy being the villain, maybe he's actually, you know, three villains or he's the hero or whatever. He's a. It doesn't matter. It, all, what you need to do is you need to look at the aspect of your game that is not fun for you and change it. Um, and try to change it in a way that's not going to be obviously going to wreck the storyline, but they can be things that the party doesn't know 100% about yet. Um, I, I hope that answers your question. Um, Renzo asked, what's my preferred game length? Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't really have one. Back in the day when I started, we used to play every Saturday for 12 hours, 10 to 12 hours, which is insane. Um, and it's also how I built my world so damn quickly. Um, obviously now I don't have time to do that and that's probably way too long, but we were fanatics. Um, I don't know. I don't really have a preferred time. I just kind of like, it kind of depends on the table energy. If we're having fun and the plot's rolling and we're, everybody looks like they're not falling asleep then we kind of keep going until there's a natural break. Um, but you know, realistically we play, I probably play for about four to six hours. Um. Yeah, five is probably a good amount. Um, anything less than four is... I don't, know, I don't feel like I can get anything done. Um, because I don't necessarily push combat every... You know, I've had a lot of sessions where we've not rolled any dice. We've just talked. Um, and of course, it sort of depends on the players that you have and the, the, the moment that you're in and the, you know, the amount of caffeine everyone's had, I guess. <clears throat> Right. Um, good God, there's a lot of people not talking. Um, <laughs> uh, on my list. Uh, oh, okay. Party splits. Um, wrote a post about, post about this too, which isn't surprising. But um, I don't have a problem problem with the party splitting. Um, I think it's kind of normal and natural to not be in each other's pockets twenty four seven. Um, I think the best way to handle a split is you need to do two things. You need to keep each segment of the split short. And you need to end each segment of the split on a cliffhanger. So the part of the thief might say, oh, okay, I'm going to peel off and go back to that tavern and get into the basement and steal that chest. All right, cool. Um, so I'll run no more than three minutes. Uh, the, the rogue getting over there, he gets in the basement, not a problem. Um, he's just about to open the chest and then I'll cut away. I'll jump back to the other party. So now the, 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 the rogue is paying attention because he wants to know what's in the chest and he's kind of waiting, anticipating. I go back to the other party and I'll say, you know, I'll run, I'll ask them what they want to do. And then as they're doing something, I'll try to find the cliffhanger -y kind of thing to jump away from. It might be in a conversation either. Like they might try to go into this place and the guard challenges them and the player might say something kind of rude to the guard and the guard might say something rude back to them and then I'll jump away. Um, but I try to keep it three minutes or less. Um, and if it goes on for too long, I'll just flat out ask the character, do you want to join the group to go back to the group? Um, I don't think splits are something to be afraid of. I think the, the reason people have trouble with them is because they don't know how to deal with them. 
And how you deal with them is that you make sure that people don't get bored by making sure everybody has a voice, just like you're playing with the group. You can't have one person go off on a tangent for an hour. Um, that's just not going to work. Um, you're going to lose your group and they're going to hate you. Um, so yeah, don't, don't be afraid of party splits. Um, I know with the idea of downtime, uh, which I've never really used cause I haven't played that much 5e. Um, I never really used it in previous editions anyway. Um, Obviously, there's going to be party splits during downtime, which can be handled usually individually, I guess. Um, okay, what else? Uh, what else is on my list? Catalysts and catapults. So I've talked about the catalyst. Um, catapults for me are, um, well, somebody's saying, you know, what do you do when, to shake up the party or push them along? Sometimes I use a catapult, which is just something weird. Um, something to get the party's attention. Something to get them talking again. Something to get them moving again. That could be, you know... Um, a flock of a thousand crows suddenly flies into the area and lands all in the buildings all around the party, or the sun goes black, or a spaceship shows up, or a bunch of dogs show up and one of them starts talking, or whatever. Um, catapults for me are when I some, sometimes use them when I've stalled out and I don't know what to do next. Um, so it's also sort of a form of future proofing that lets me sort of improvise around something um, because, you know. People run out of ideas, and it happens to me all the time. Um, okay, question from uh, RVA Nerd. How do you guide player focus without creating the, oh, if it's important to the DM, will tell us mindset? Or more specifically, how can you work with players to grow their creativity? That's a good question. Uh, I think having conversation with your party in the beginning during session zero about the kind of DM you are and what they can expect is really, really, really important. and. I think you really need to to explicitly, you know, talk to your players about the fact that they need to bring their curiosity, they need to bring their creativity, they need to bring their enthusiasm to the game because we're all doing this together. I'm not here to entertain you. We're here to entertain each other. Um, and I, and to that end, I tell them that they really, if they want to know stuff, they need to ask questions. I'm not going to always spoon feed them answers. Um, the simple act of not asking a question will oftentimes change the story. You know, what's the, the that's the the trope about you know rom coms or whatever? The, none of this shit would happen if people just talk to each other. Um, and that's true in the game as well. Um, I don't know. I don't really have much time for people who are lazy about their creativity and they're lazy with, with what they bring to the game. Like, you got to show up and be be willing to do something and not just sit back and and let me tell you a story. That's that's not really playing the game. Go watch a movie if you want to do that. Um, how you want to, how you can work with them to grow their creativity is just give them stuff to play with. Like give them enough tools to be creative. If they're an alchemist, let them find all kinds of reagents. Um, you know, creativity can come out in all kinds of ways. It ne doesn't necessarily have to be role playing. It might be the things that they do or the plots they set up, or even the conversations they have with the, with the other party members. Like I had this guy who was a bard who was really shy about role-playing with the world, but he loved talking to his friends. And so every night around the campfire, he'd tell stories or sing songs or, you know, he'd, he'd ask the party members uh, to tell them, tell him stories about stuff that never really happened, but like would make them, you know, it kind of forced them to improvise and role-play. He'd be like, you know, Mike, tell me about that time we were down south and got in a fight with that dragon. I can't remember. Um, you know, and sometimes that really worked really well and sometimes it fell flat on its ass, but at least... It was creative, and and I was giving him the ability to do that by saying every night when we got around the campfire, I would say to the bard, "Hey, do you want to do you want to do you want to entertain the guys? Do you want to talk? What do you guys want to do?" Um, I have this sheet of paper that I have pinned to my shield. Um, it's called the Dungeon Master Dashboard. Um, I can put a link to it in the chat, but basically, it's like a list of things that I try to do every day so I don't forget. So, for example. <clears throat> um, in the morning, I do the daily check. I, I figure out the weather, I update the calendar, and I announce the time and what the weather's like. Uh, then I do the camp check. So the party. Um, so I. So let me back up a bit. I have. I like to have table rolls. So there's a few different table rolls which are meta um, rolls that the players do for me. So there's the quartermaster, who keeps track of the party supplies and the food. There's the vault master who keeps track of all the cash and the wealth. 
Uh, there's the Beastmaster who tracks all the party kills and all the drippy the drippy claws and fangs that you cut off of monsters and put them in the drippy sack, as we used to call it. Um, and then there's the scribe who writes down the journal and keeps the maps and stuff. Um, so in the morning, I'll have, you know, the party prepares their food. I, the quartermaster has to update his log. Um, I'll ask people if they have any specific rituals or activities they want to do. If there's anything special they want to do, I'll ask them what they plan on doing today, and then we break camp, and then I start rolling for my encounters. Um, and there's a bunch more things on this list, which I'll show you. But And part of that is, is at night, there's a, a camp check, and that's a great opportunity for your players to interact with each other. And you know, you can even prompt them. You might say, hey, fighter, do you want to tell Mage you know, a joke? Or do you want to ask him about what his childhood was like or something? Um, there's lots of ways to push your creativity. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, okay. You alright? Yeah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I just learned how to drink this morning. Um, <clears throat> best player character death story. <clears throat> um, yeah. I don't know about best, but this is kind of the funniest. Um, I had a trap in one of my dungeons. It was a big pit. It was a well. Uh, I was like 15 feet across, about 60 feet deep. Excuse me. I'm really sorry. Um, I had three players. They were all really new. And this trap was is that the the room was slightly slanted in towards this pit, so it was a little bit slippery. You could easily slide into it. And a foot from the bottom of the pit was a teleportation stone that would teleport you to one foot below the lip. So it was basically an endlessly falling trap. And I figured the solution was pretty easy. You know, the other guys <clears throat> throw a rope to the guy who's stuck in the trap. But these guys, they were really new. They didn't have any rope. They hadn't brought any. And they kind of scratched their heads and debated for 10 minutes. And then they left him there and went back to town and got drunk. And basically, that guy died. Um, he starved to death. As far as I know, his corpse is still teleporting in that circle. Um it made me laugh really hard, and it's one of the stories I remember from like really early on when I was DMing. Um, all right, I got a few more things on the list here. Um, let's talk about uh, let's talk about curses. Um, I really like curses. Um, I don't like the way the game handles it. Um, remove curse is just boring. Um, I don't like the idea that you know what a you know, you know instantly when you picked up a cursed item. It's not really that much fun. Um, they can be really interesting narratively because the whole idea behind a curse, especially a cursed weapon, is that it has a something that you really, really want to use or that you really, really need. But you know that by using it, it's going to screw you. And that creates a really interesting conflict. <clears throat> um, you know, it might be a curse that every time you use it, it gets worse. Um, but it's you know it might it might have some sort of crazily interesting magical power to it. Maybe it can resurrect people, but you know every time you use it, it, it just screws you harder and harder, and, and eventually it may destroy you. But um, you know I think curses should have a few things. They should have a really interesting backstory about how the object came to be. Um, you know you need to figure out what kind of curse it is. Is it is it a latent curse which doesn't trigger right away and is not identifiable by identifier or attunement? Uh, is it you know what kind of is it a curse that can actually be lifted maybe it's a, you know maybe it's a curse from a god it's just way too powerful and you're just kind of stuck with it um those kinds of things i don't like to put i don't like to make too strong because the party can really never get rid of it but it can be interesting as well uh, i have a post about it all the things i talk about so i think you shouldn't be shy about giving your stuff you're giving your players things that are kind of negative and bad because you can make them in a way that still makes them interesting um that kind of feeds into prisons and crime. Um, I don't think 
that I can really deal with another prison break in D&D. Oh, God, I'm so tired of them. I mean, I don't even know why they build prisons in D&D. Everybody breaks out of them. Um, you know, uh, I think prison can be a really interesting an interesting thing to put in your game. Like, if your party really screws up and they go to jail, I think it's fun to play out their imprisonment. Um, you know, you can make D&D jails really interesting. It could be like an island where they have to work, or it could be some sphere floating in the astral plane or it can be whatever but there's an opportunity to role play there and to make enemies and to make friends and to make the time in jail mean something other than okay well you guys got thrown in the prison for three weeks and then you paid a fine and you're out because that doesn't give them any disincentive to go and do what they just did um if they murder a bunch of people and they go to jail for 20 years i mean you don't have to play out the whole 20 years but a couple three sessions in jail they might not want to go back to jail after that um, but they'll have stories to tell, you know, and it mattered to them. It was a part of their life. It wasn't just a sentence or two. Um, you know, I, I think that we shouldn't shy away from, this feeds back on the cursor, we shouldn't shy away from quote unquote negative experiences because they, they're still interesting. Um, it doesn't have to be the happy, happy fun parade all the time. Um, you know, we need we need ups and downs, highs and lows, strikes and gutters to make life and stories interesting. Um, and then uh, we'll feed into religion and piety, especially. Um, <clears throat> when I was running my world, uh, Drexel, before it cracked in half and no longer exists, that was the one I ran for 27 years. Um, faith made a big was a big deal. Like um, nobody got resurrected by the church unless they were faithful. Um, you couldn't just be a rich guy. You couldn't buy your way into into getting resurrected. You had to be a a member of the church in good standing. Um, what you believed um, was known to your neighbors. You kind of knew who they worshipped, and that drove a lot of social dynamics, um, which I think is interesting. And instead of just being a list of deities, and you know, people go to church on Sunday. I don't know. Religion should be more interesting than that. Like, ritual is a big deal, and it was a big deal in, in people's lives, especially ancient people. <clears throat> you know, ritual, the purpose of a ritual is to petition the gods for something, like you're trading something. You're giving the gods something, and you're getting something in return. And um, I think that's really important, and it's really, it makes a culture interesting. What kind of rituals they perform, what their holidays look like, um, what their, you know, what their priests do. Like, what is the role of the priest in the society, and not just cleric? You know, like <clears throat> if you look at, um, uh, you know, the, the the priesthood in ancient Egypt, for example, they were really interesting. They had they controlled different aspects of life. Um, yeah, I think reading up about religions and cults and things like that, I think will really deepen and, and make your games a lot more interesting. <laughs> uh, uh, speaking of curses, this is from Blue Death. How do I deal with game mechanics that nullify a particular element of the game without making, without taking away, making players feel powerful and rewarded for their builds or spell choices? Top of the mind, lay of lay on hands for disease, tiny Liam and tiny hut for safe rest, good berry for food rationing, crave food and water for desert travel. Um, well, I, I ran hardcore survival games for a lot of years, and good berry was the first thing I tossed out, um, and crave food and water as well because that just makes it too easy. Um, I don't really have a good answer for that. Um, I think the way that I've kind of mitigated it throughout the years was, especially like the, with disease is, and this kind of goes back to curses, and I don't know if this was a mechanic back in second edition or first, but it's kind of something that I've always thought of is that if, uh, say, the curse caster is fifth level and you're only third, you're never going to be able to lift it. You've got to be higher level than the person who cast the thing. And with disease, you can sort of assign it a level number. Um, maybe it's a disease that the paladin can't heal because it's just too it's just too strong. Um, it's too deadly. It's too whatever. Um, the lay on hands can maybe mitigate some of the more severe symptoms, but it's not going to completely get rid of it. Um, I know what I know. There's a popular thing going through the community about you know death doesn't always have to be the end of a combat. You can get scars. Uh, you can get kind of permanent injuries and things like that. I mean, you can use things like that where, the, where you're mitigating the the effect um, a little bit without actually getting rid of it completely. 
um lame and sunny hut i mean the joke is that the monsters just wait outside um yeah i don't know i'm not sure that was a good answer but um i think i am at the end of my list oh no controlling wealth um yeah i've written a lot about this um you know, every DM makes a mistake. They give their parties way too much treasure and way too much coin. Um, I did it. Uh, I did it for many, many, many years. Um, but then I realized that it was a lot easier to, I mean, it was great and fun and interesting to give your party money. It's, it makes you feel good. You feel like Santa Claus. But it's really, really easy to take it away, too. Um, taxes, ties, tolls, fees, fines. Um, there's lots of ways. Um, you need money to to live. You need money to pay fines when you break shit. You need money to get into cities. You need money to buy food. Um, I ran this thing once where my party found a million gold pieces in a meadow, just a big pile of them. And that was all I wrote. The rest of it, the, the campaign was them trying to get this money uh, out of this meadow and do something with it without being robbed, blind, or exploited, which is what all, pretty much what I did to them is I just threw everybody at them who wanted a piece so when you have wealth then you're a target um so yeah horde golem exactly um i i think it's controlling wealth is a lot easier if you can convince your party to put their wealth into things that they can't carry around like property or art or um using it to maintain relationships or or, or things of that nature um you can give them money but you can easily siphon it away too and then if you do it in a slow enough trickle, they won't feel that bad about it because they won't really notice. Um, uh, great, Trickster. Thank you. Glad for be glad you were here. Thanks for listening. Um, yeah, I don't think I really have anything left on my list, so I'm going to kind of open up the floor and ask me anything. This was fun. I had fun. But um, I'm sorry, my voice is so screwed up. Let's see. Oh, looks like a couple of people are typing there. Sure. That was only an hour. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, well, they're type in. So yeah, last last call for any other questions or comments. Just type them in the chat. Yeah. Uh, what racing class would I suggest for a beginner? Human fighter. What's the easiest? I mean, that's the traditional answer, I think. Um, speaking of that, um, something I neglected to mention that I wanted to mention was, as a dungeon master, you should play every class at least once if you can. Um, and the reason for that is the more you play, then the more you understand what's fun for that character. Um, and you'll be able to give those people a better experience. Um, like I was really low to, to DM Warlocks in 5e because I'd never played one. I don't know what, I don't really know what a Warlock experience feels like. Um, so yeah, if you can play more, do so. I know most of us don't have that luxury, but if you can, I recommend it. Uh, back in the day, I used to tell people to play all the alignments too, but Nobody wants to dig up that old that old chestnut and let it die. Keep it in the history in the past where it belongs. Any other questions? Everyone's staring at me without speaking. Not creepy at all. <laughs> uh, when you're choosing a game, how do you gauge a good DM from a poor from a player side? Uh, well, the main thing is. Um, what kind of agency the DM gives me and how finicky they are with rolling. Um, I had a DM who used to make my rogue roll to climb trees in dry weather. And it used to drive me insane. Like this is the kind of DM who would make you, you know, roll to see if you're drunk. Um, I don't like DMs who put too much mechanics on mm -hmm. mundane things. So for me anyway, I, I, to me, that's kind of a poor DM. Um, only ask for roles when they're going to matter, I guess. Um, and, if, you know, if the DM is talking too much, uh, if, if they're reading too much, if it seems like they're trying to tell a story and you're just characters in their novel, um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really kind of personal question. It depends on how you like to play, I guess. <clears throat> RPG horror stories, there you go. Luckily, in all the decades that I played, I never ran into any of the rapey neckbeards that people talk about. Thank God for that. Um, no other questions? Um, I'll just say that I do mentoring one-on-one. -on -one. If you're interested, um, send me a message. I'm happy to help you guys world build or build plots or, or just chat about whatever. Um, I've written a couple of books. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, put a link to that and to my history and, and uh, just say thank you to everybody for letting me do this. This was fun. Cool. Yeah, yeah. If there's no other questions or comments, we'll see what uh, Rinsler and people say. But um, yeah, thanks for doing this, Matt. And um, if, uh, yeah, we can, uh, we'll share the, share some links in the chat channel here sure. and we yep. can do it on the because this is on on twitch and it'll be on youtube too so we can put some links oh. there if someone's watching this in the future and looking for stuff um otherwise i think yeah it looks like it's just uh, some thank yous and things so that's cool um all right well thanks hey thanks for doing this i appreciate it uh, appreciate you taking the time to to share some of your wisdom uh -huh. well that's debatable but yeah it was fun <laughs> and uh is there anywhere anything else you wanted to share in terms of links or? Uh... Well, no, I think that's pretty much it. And just you know, I'm glad you guys are all here. I'm glad you guys are learning, keeping the game rolling forward. So you know, I think that's great. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the cult. Cool. And uh, yeah, like I said, if you're watching this on uh, in the future on YouTube or anything, you want to come join our community and chat with people. Um, Please. Yep. Check out uh, dndnewbies.com. You can join the Discord server there and have have a good chat with us. Um, our next special event is going to be on this coming Wednesday, which I'm not sure what the actual day. I think that's the 18th. 18th, I believe. Yep. Um, and that is going to be about some character building basics. So if you want to tune in, same deal. Just check out the special events channel here. Um, if you are interested in running your own special event, just reach out and we got a process for that. Uh, that's also specified on the dndnewbies.com get started page. You can check that out, the video there. Um, and then lastly, if anyone, if you guys wanna stick around and keep the conversation going um, just among yourselves or whatever, feel free to move from this channel to the tavern. Your mics will be unmuted and you can chat and, have, and, uh, and do that. Otherwise, thanks everyone for tuning in. Thanks again, Famous Hippo, for taking the time and uh, have a great day. Thanks, guys. See ya.